Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Juma Mubarak, everybody. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inahu wa nasta'afirhu wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyi'ati amalina. Man yadihillahu fala mudilla lahu wa man yudlilhu fala hadiya lah. Wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lahu. Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasoolu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All praise. Seek help and forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil of our own souls and from our bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides will never be led astray, and whomsoever Allah leads astray, none can guide. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except Allah, that there is no God but Allah, the one having no partner. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is Allah's servant and messenger. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqullah haqqa tuqatih wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. Ya ayyuhal nas utaku rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahidata wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nisaa. Wa attaku allah alladhi tasa'aluna bihi wal arham inna allaha kana alaykum raqiba. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد O oh, ye who believe be mindful of Allah in the way that Allah deserves and do not die except in a state of full submission to Allah O oh, humanity be mindful of your creator who created you from a single soul and from it created its mate and through both Allah spread countless men and women and be mindful of Allah in whose name you appeal to one another and honor your ties of kinship surely Allah is ever watchful over you O ye who believe be mindful of Allah and say what is right Allah will bless your deeds for you and forgive your sins and whoever obeys Allah and the messenger of Allah has truly achieved a great triumph رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي so بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم so uh assalamu alaikum again everybody today i woke up uh, knowing that i would be attending the khutbah juma um but i didn't know i'd be the one giving it uh so due to some outstanding circumstances brother omar wasn't able to make it today and i i know his message will be sorely missed especially by me but i'll try to do my best and fill a bit of the void in um though i feel brother omar is someone uh, much better than me and i i i woke up today really looking forward to it but you know alhamdulillah some uh, some things are are better left for other times and so it's safe to say that this this khutbah reflection was quite unexpected or unplanned and however unlike many other khutbahs that i've had to give or that i've given um i've had uh, the chance to give them ahead of time and had a chance to plan for some reason I actually kind of knew what I wanted to talk about. And this was, you know, just within the hour that I, that I was uh, signed up to, to go ahead and do this. But, uh, you know, it was very, very surprising to me because usually, you know, I'll have weeks in advance, but even then up till the day of the khutbah, I won't know what to, what to really talk about. But this time around, I feel like the second that, uh, uh, that the message came around, I was like, I think I know what I'd like to talk about. It might not be a complete thought, which is okay, because I think that it uh, is something that I've been thinking about, especially as of this week. So you see, for the last nine weeks or so, including this week, uh, here at Muslim Space, we've been going through the life of the Prophet Sallallahu through a summer series program called The Prophet and I, The Prophet Sallallahu and I. And so the aim of the series, as we've mentioned before, is to help us as Muslims and even non-Muslims living in the 21st century, in this society, in this day and age, uh, to take a look at how the biography and the example of the Prophet ﷺ is not just significant or something that is important, but something that's really contextually relevant to us in our time today, especially in relation to the various types of people that he was surrounded by, the various types of things that in his society that were going on. Oftentimes, and in our uh, study of the Prophet Muhammad, or in, the, in our relation of the Prophet Muhammad, we sometimes see that uh, these are two completely different time periods. These are two completely different day and ages. And so it's hard to relate exactly 
what uh, what would go on at that time and how the Prophet dealt with certain things or interacted at that time or how his companions interacted at that time would be something that we can draw from. But in fact, it is a very rich well that uh, it, that is a source of guidance for us during this time, not just a guidance religiously, but a guidance for us in our everyday lives, just humanistically looking at it. And so today's circumstance uh, with regards to the khutbah of having to deal with something unexpected and to have to be on one's feet to think of how to quickly move and to think about what to do next in the heat of a moment is actually something that is of particular relevance for our Sira session later today in the evening uh, as we dive into the farewell and the inevitable death of the Prophet ﷺ, which talks and gives us a uh, a bit of an example of having to think about uh, having to think on your feet, but more specifically, having to have faith on your feet. So there's this expression of being able to be quick on your feet or to think on your feet, to be able to do something quick. And so this concept of having faith on our feet, uh, not necessarily literally of having faith on your feet, but having this faith just to, to respond to the different things that come up to us in, in, in our life, the unexpected twists and turns, and how the this aspect of the Prophet biography, this death, this chapter that closed was an example that for us today, especially for me today, is one that's relevant and it continues each and every day, but one that has some really rich meanings that I hope we can talk about today, but also uh, take away from this Jum'ah session. We can think about it in our everyday lives. By no means is this conclusive. By no means is this uh, a, a final point for it. This is a chance for us to explore what does this look like for each of us. And so you see that in the Prophet's time, despite what towards the end of his life, despite multiple premonitions and hints that the Prophet would give his family and companions uh, and the Muslim community in general of his time nearing that it was about his, his time was drawing to a close. He had told Fatima earlier that, you know, normally Jibreel comes and reveals the recites the Quran to me once you know, during Ramadan or we'll recite it once uh, through and this time he did it twice and so I think that that means that my time is coming to a close so he would give indications like this in private as well as uh, in general uh, during khutbahs during different talks and whatnot uh, so these hints were being given but nobody really truly believed that it was something that would come to pass at least immediately. It wasn't something that was on the horizon or something that would be within the next few days. It was felt like it was like, okay, you know, that's just something general, but at, you know, at least at the present things seem to be okay. And rather, even when he was at the peak of his illness, when he had his illness, he was undergoing a tremendous headache and fever, um, you know, and he was on his, uh, his, it was what, which was to be his deathbed. He was on this bed and, you know, people were still holding out hope that he would get better. There's, there's stories where he was on his deathbed um, and he would just, you know, want to have a look at the congregation while they're praying. He would just want to be able to see people or he'd be, want to be able to go address them. And so he'd have to be helped and lifted over there. But even then, people are just like, the Prophet is going to make it. The Prophet is going to make it. You know, so many of us who maybe have experienced the passing of a loved one, especially with a difficult uh, illness or something very traumatic, uh, if it's cancer or some kind of accident or any kind of uh, any kind of pang of death, really, uh, oftentimes when we're when we're with that person, um, much of that time we're thinking about that this person's going to make it. Like you know, they, they, they'll make it. This is just a uh, a bit of a trough in, in this person's uh, life right now, but they're, they're going to come out. It's going to be a peak after this. They're going to make it through. And even when, you know, you get a terrible diagnosis, you get something that that is fairly conclusive, even then you're still in your mind feeling that, no, this, like, I know this person, especially if you know that person very intimately, if you've lost a parent, if you've lost a loved one, um, you know, and you know that person, you, you feel like that, that it's, it's just it's their 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 life hasn't concluded yet. None of our lives really feel like they're one hundred percent complete. And especially in the case of the Prophet ﷺ, um, you know, he was he was older for with regards to that time. But you know, he was not by any means seen as uh, someone who had completed everything that was just done. And now everything is set. Everybody's good. It still the Muslim community was still in the motions. You know, there were armies still going to foreign lands. There were different uh, expansions occurring. Delegations were still coming in from 
from different parts of the land coming to accept Islam and wanting to meet the prophet, things were still moving. It wasn't that Islam hit this kind of crescendo and was now just going uh, to a different level. It was, it, was, it, it was quite a bit just in the midst of everything going. And so uh, despite these, despite all these uh, indications, though, as I mentioned, nobody really uh, would believe that this is coming to pass. And even at that peak of that illness, we see all of them still holding out hope that he would get better. You know, people would ask about the process of how's he doing? And even his family members were like, he's, he's getting better today. He's doing better. Um, I had an uncle who passed away from cancer. And of course, in the, in the last stages of cancers, there are some days, a few days that might be good. That might be complete reversal of what the rest of that condition might be like. And, uh, you know, see, remembering that in that case, you know, some of my relatives were like, yeah, he's, he's doing good. He's doing better. Giving that hope that, hey, this is this is he, he's beating it he's doing he's doing fine and then in a couple of days um him passing away and so just thinking of that in the context of the prophet Salaam and what his relatives what the people at that time thought that hey he's doing a lot better today but the next day he might have passed and so we know uh, as as the story goes on that the prophet didn't get better and after taking his last breaths in Aisha's lap, in Aisha's lap, he, he's, uh, she's holding him at her chest. He's taking his last breath. Uh, the scene in Medina was one that was overcome with sorrow and grief. It was one with tears flowing. It was one where men and women were breaking down. Some people were just shouting. Some people were losing it. Uh, other people just were catatonic and couldn't say anything, couldn't do anything. It was just an utter shock. And we'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit, but uh, they weren't not really sure about what to make of this like what what just happened because this was unfathomable this was something that was simply unexpected this was not this was not something they could have planned for and in the example of uh, a very famous example of uh, Umar radiallahu anhu's uh, re reaction we get a perfect reaction for what this loss truly meant uh, and how it was personified, just what, what at levels of grief, what reaction this, this, this entailed gives us an insight to what this impact was like, that uh, when hearing about the death of the Prophet Omar came to the mosque, and you know, upon hearing and being told that the Prophet had died, he hastened to his anger, he's someone who's quick to anger, he got really angry and threatened to kill anyone who would say that the Prophet ﷺ was dead because uh, it was not the case for him. That, that was not the case. The Prophet couldn't die. The Prophet was someone who was going to, at this time, you know, it was seeming like he's dead, but he was someone who had, uh, you know, ascended like Moses did to Sinai and that he would come back. He's, he's just like in a, in a coma state. He's not, he's not really dead. But uh, simultaneously, though, we see on the other hand, Abu Bakr, another companion of the Prophet, someone of his closest friends, was going into the home of his daughter Aisha, who was the wife of the Prophet, and where the Prophet lay on, on that, uh, that couch or that, that bed, um, and confirmed what, what had passed. He, he, you know, he, he took off the cover of uh, the, the shroud, looked at the Prophet, you know, rubbed his hand over him, and he, he started weeping. And he you know, made some very intimate comments with regards to just saying like how beautiful the Prophet was even in death, uh, and sharing some really intimate moments right there, but coming to terms with what had happened. You know, just imagine that Abu Bakr was someone who had known the Prophet for almost his, uh, since his childhood, you know, and he had been with him every step of the way. Uh, and of course, was a person who had left Mecca with him, who had escaped Mecca with him, and who was referred to in the Quran as Thani Ithnain, that the, the second of two, um, that, you know, in, the companion of the cave. And so the uh, this concept of Abu Bakr for having to see this, this whole life cycle, for him, you know, you could probably expect this kind of reaction as well, that he was someone who spent almost every waking moment, it seemed, with the Prophet Sallam, and to have to come to terms that the Prophet Sallam has passed. Um, he, he, he knew what, 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 what had happened, but again, he could have been, he was absolutely in his right to react like the rest of the town did, because like we'll talk about in a second, the Prophet Sallam's death was not just the passing of any ordinary person, and we'll, we'll mention that in a bit, but for him to know that, but then at the, at the same time, having to think on his feet, having to have that faith on his feet, really shows about what what is about to happen when he steps outside he steps outside omar is still angrily shouting and absolutely justified in, in his shouting because losing the prophet is is something we can't quantify we can't qualify that 
And Omar's still angrily shouting, and Abu Bakr came and says, you know, gently, Omar, gently. Like, you know, he tells him, just, you know, just, just settle down. And Omar's still, still, you know, in a bit of a heat, and so he's really upset. And then Abu Bakr says, you know what, I'm, I can't outshout Omar, so I'm just going to go over here, and I'm going to just start speaking to the people. And the people naturally came over to Abu Bakr, and they, they started to go away from Omar. And uh, Abu Bakr told them very straightforwardly, very uh, boldly, that whosoever worshipped Muhammad Sallallahu should know that Muhammad Sallallahu had passed away and was dead. And whosoever worshipped Allah, know that Allah was living and that Allah did not die and does not die. And he, at that moment as well, recited the verse of Surah Ali Imran that Muhammad is not, a message, mess, uh, is not but a messenger, that other messengers have passed on before him. So if he was to die or to be killed, would you turn your back? Would you, O oh Muslims, turn your back on your heels and uh, turn back on your heels? And he who turns back on their heels will never harm Allah at all, but Allah will reward the grateful. And for many in the audience, especially Omar, they related that it was as if this was their first time hearing that verse because it had been revealed much earlier but for them in that moment, with this shock of what just happened, they just naturally, you think of having a traumatic incident in your life, something really brutal happens, something very tragic happens. Think about how well your recollection is of very specific things. You, you don't think about that no more. You're, you're kind of in a bit of a, a shock, a bit of a loss, and you can't really process too many of these memories. Abu Bakr at that time had faith on his feet. He got faith on his feet and he knew exactly what to say and when to say it because of the fact of, uh, you know, what he had realized at that moment that faith was greater than the Prophet Sallallahu Islam was bigger than the Prophet Sallallahu even though uh, the Prophet Sallallahu was this fountainhead for which all this faith and all Islamic teachings and all whatnot had come through, the Prophet Sallallahu was not the end. He was not the end of uh, this, this faith known as Islam. He was the seal. He was not the faith that it would, that it would just stop with him. And so you see in there that whenever we hear the story, though, it's oftentimes we do it very simply in admiration of Abu Bakr's forbearance, which by no doubt is to be extolled and praised by all means. In, in a situation like that, having that kind of patience, having that kind of foresight, that's absolutely to be extolled. However, we never probably think and stop to wonder what might have Abu Bakr been thinking at this time? Who would do the Friday prayer? Someone probably would think. Who would lead the congregation in prayer? Who would the people be able to continue uh, to have faith in despite losing their prophet? Thinking about when we read about the Prophet he wasn't just an imam. He wasn't just someone who led the prayers and did the rituals. The Prophet was someone who cared for the orphans. He was someone who cared for the widows. He was someone who would go door to door and check on people. He would be someone who was in touch with his community to people, uh, men and women, who could come up to him and ask him for questions, ask him for favors, ask him for these things. He was someone that was holistically a part of the community. He wasn't just one element of it. And so we think about these things that when, when Abu Bakr is probably saying these, he's probably thinking in the back of his mind as are so many of the other muslims who's going to do this now who's going to have to, who's going to do this like who's going to fill this void and also think about not just with abu Bakr having to think on his feet but in validating the grief of the community think about who had just they had just lost and not just who they lost but what they had lost and what impact it had on them what did it mean for them to lose the person who uh, blessed them with the faith, uh, the message of the faith itself? We, we talked about how the Prophet ﷺ was not just a prophet, was not just a imam, was not just a messenger. He was someone that was involved in all facets of the community. He was a father. He was someone who was uh, essentially like a, uh, you know, was, was a provider for so many. He was someone who was uh, for many people, their, their counselor. He was for many people, their, uh, their, their care provider. He took care of them. He took care of the people who were marginalized and poor. He ran essentially a refugee center out of his masjid with the Ahl Sufa, with the people of the bench. He did so many of these different things. And so uh, we, we see a hadith or a tradition that was shared how the Prophet would make, um, this is actually in the Shamail, the 
um, the particulars of the Prophet ﷺ, what, what his inner characters were like, but that he would make people feel when they sat in his company as if they were the most important person at that time and as if nobody mattered more. And he made every person feel that they were the most beloved to him. So you could be a complete stranger, you could be a complete uh, like late convert to Islam, but he would sit with you in such a way, he would honor you in such a way that you would feel that this person, uh, that he, he, he loves nobody more than me because who, who could keep this up for every person? But the Prophet ﷺ did that with each and every person that would seek his time, that would be in front of him. And so imagine when the community is weeping, when they're, when they're trying to make sense of this, they've lost not just their prophet, they've probably lost someone who's very much like their father. They've lost someone who's very much like their brother they've lost someone for who if he, if he was uh younger than some people who may have felt like a son they've they've lost all these different connections there uh and 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 so just thinking about what this loss meant to them but then also reflecting back how in the face of all this because of these four, first and foremost you would have the family of the prophet ﷺ and abu Bakr who were with the prophet ﷺ since day one what they would have seen and what they would have felt as well and reflect this back on how Abu Bakr's reaction and statement at that moment that was so unexpected showed that faith and that Islam itself is bigger than any one person. And even if that person was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself, and for us that when we put our faith and trust not solely in any just one person, but in the one who created them, we'll find that not just our faith, but our matter itself, our situation, our circumstance will not be lost. If this khutbah was just dependent on one specific person, one person to just do this, and we just put that investment in that one person to be able to do it or to not do it, um, that, you know, for us, that experience is then just dependent on that one person. What Allah teaches us, even in taking away the Prophet ﷺ from the community of believers, when by all means, it was still not the, the end of uh, any kind of chapter or whatnot, uh, taking away the Prophet ﷺ at such a formative moment, we see that Allah teaches even at most significant lesson to the people there as well as for us that uh, all things are in Allah's hands all things are in uh, with Allah and that all faith should be placed within Allah because each of us are here myself anyone else that we're all mortal people your your folks at work your parents your loved ones they're all mortal people so how much do you truly invest in them and how much do you invest in Allah? That's not to say that you don't show them love, you don't do any of these things that are that are due to them, but to think about uh, how much of a gap was it for the people that when the Prophet ﷺ had passed, what kind of faith crisis did they have? Did it, was he is he is he gone? Like you know, is what is Islam now? And Abu Bakr being able to remind them gently that Muhammad ﷺ was just a man. And he will pass and others have passed before him and that Allah is not. Allah is someone who is living and everlasting. And so he's al-hayyul qayyum. He's, he's the one who's everlasting. He's alive. And so what does that say for us today? And so as we wrap up here, I want us to think that in this moment, Abu Bakr had to think on his feet. He had to have faith on his feet. And that's something which in this day and age, day and age we absolutely need as well. How many times for us, we are now 14, 13 centuries separated from the Prophet Sallallahu How many times for us when we have our faith in Islam, when we have our faith in general, do we probably put that just in one person who taught us that faith or the example of one person? We find a scholar that we really like and we invest our faith in that person or we have it from our parents and we invest our faith in that person and solely that. And if something goes wrong, if that scholar gets in some kind of scandal or if our parent does something wrong or something happens, that usually ends up being a crisis of faith for us. But we take a look at where was our faith really beforehand? Was our faith in the messenger or was our faith in the one who provided the message, what was the one who created all of this. And so it gives us an opportunity when we see this, when life throws us these unexpected curveballs, when life shoots all these things at us without uh, any kind of warning for us as a reminder that by having our faith on our feet, that doesn't mean we're just you know quickly thinking about what to do, but that faith on our feet comes because we have a connection to the divine who sends these unexpected things, who brings these trials. Uh, as the Quran relates that, do you think that you will not go through this life and not be tested? Tested. Do the people not think that they'll go through life and not be tested, especially the believers? So this uh, for us, inshallah, will be an opportunity for us to reflect, for us to think about where does our faith lie? Where do outward, when we evaluate and we sit back and we think, who do we put?
put our faith in and why? And also, where does that faith truly lie? It, it's not wrong to put that faith in a person, but also understanding that that person is finite and that true faith, true belief rests with the one who created, the one who had sent. And this is what the, uh, the early Muslim community was taught at its most traumatic moment in a time of absolute grief, because you can't understand that loss unless you know who the Prophet ﷺ was at that moment. He wasn't just a prophet who had just been lost. He was someone who was uh, every aspect of that community, that, that, that glue that held it together. And as soon as you take that away, this was a test to that Muslim community that where does your faith really lie? And for someone like Abu Bakr to step up and remind them is that uh, for us as well, it's that, that reminder is today that if we lose anybody so-and-so, if we falter, if anything happens, that that glue that holds us together was not that person, but that person was working through Allah to put us together. So inshallah, we will close out in the second, uh, in the second part just briefly um, as we reflect on this. I say these words of mine and I ask forgiveness for myself and for you all. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. My thanks and gratitude belong to Allah, the Lord of all of humanity, and I ask Allah to bless and bestow peace on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So in conclusion, we think about where life takes us. We think about the curveball that, uh, that life brings us. And we think about where the Muslim community was at this time. They were people who were essentially in darkness. There were people who were just navigating through life. And this message was sent to them. This message was sent to one amongst them. And like a shepherd in the darkness, he was guiding them throughout. He was guiding them through these different twists and turns for over 23 years. He was guiding them. And uh, at one point, though, at one stop, that uh, shepherd was taken away, that shepherd was removed. And uh, people had then felt that, you know, are, are we still on the path? Or can we even continue without a shepherd? Can we even go without a shepherd for one day, two days, three days? We know that the community then had selected a Khalifa afterwards to, to take over. But for that time, like, you know, you you, you, you take away the, the, the main part of the machine, you take away the main part, the, the glue that holds everything together, is everything going to stay in place or is it going to fragment? And we see at that time, you have the gentle reminder and you have the Quran because that verse is still with us today that will we turn our backs when uh, Allah is the one who is alive? Will we turn our backs when uh, the Prophet ﷺ had passed or the person who we put our faith in has passed. So brothers and sisters, we leave this Jumai, inshallah, knowing that the unexpected is not too unexpected for us. It, it, we, we can maybe expect it, but uh, the unexpected will come for each and every one of us in various shapes and forms. And that this unexpected is a form of a test. It was a test, not just for us, not just for a certain group of people. It was a test for even those who were the closest to the Prophet ﷺ and by default, the closest uh, and most beloved to Allah. So if these folks were tested to that extent, uh, we should take some comfort in knowing that the tests that befall us also may fall in this light, but that the lesson is still the same. That's why uh, in tonight's Sirah class, inshallah, we hope to reinforce this, but in general, we reinforce, these are not just stories that we tell kids at night. These are not just uh, things that we answer multiple choice tests for. These are not just things we keep on a bookshelf and never relate to. These are stories and situations that have very significant and deep meanings for us today. How do we deal with grief? How do we deal with loss? How do we deal with crises of faith? And what this moment shows us that when we lose someone, when we have to think quickly on our feet, first and foremost, we place that trust in Allah. First and foremost, we know where the situation comes from and we uh, put the faith there because we, we can express grief. The, uh, the Abu Bakr, I want to make it clear, did not come out and say, hey, everybody, stop crying. Everybody, stop wailing. Stop doing this. Stop doing that. He didn't shut down everybody's emotions. He validated them. He said, uh, but he had reminded them that know that if uh, he didn't say uh, for those who cry um, over Muhammad, know that Muhammad's uh, dead. And for those, um, you know, who don't cry, know that Allah's alive. He didn't say that. He said that for those who feel, who, who believe that, um, you know, Muhammad uh, is, is alive or for those who worship Muhammad, know that Muhammad's dead. So he, he, he connected it very finely. Who do you worship? 
Who do you erect as your idols? Who do you put up uh, before God as yourself when we think about what we might lose and what that says with our relationship to God? So uh, if we lose something, does that mean we feel like we've lost faith, that we've lost any belief in God? Is that our, our whole connection to God is lost because we've lost that one thing, if it's our property, if it's our uh, loved one or anything like that? So Abu Bakr very poignantly said, for those who worship Muhammad, know that Muhammad has passed. But those who worship Allah know that Allah is alive. Uh, uh, but he gave them that space because he knew exactly if anybody knew good what the Prophet was and who he was, it was Abu Bakr because he had been there with him. But he had known what the Prophet was. He gave them that space to process that grief, but he reminded them that who you worship is very important because the one you worship who's mortal, that person's going to go away. But the one who you worship who is God uh, will not go away and will always be there. So may Allah give us the tawfiq, may Allah give us the strength and the forbearance to bear very difficult, unexpected things in our life and in our circumstances with the utmost patience, but also recognizing we have that allowance and that we have that space to grieve. We have that space to feel hurt. We have that space to feel pain, um, but that at the end of the day, we do so uh, with that connection to Allah. A connection to Allah doesn't mean that you just dry your tears, that you do everything and you just act like nothing had happened. You just be stoic like a statue. A connection to Allah means you're fully expressive of your emotions, but you remind yourself that from Allah we came, to Allah return in all matters. So, Jazakallah khair. Um, inshallah, we uh, will conclude here. Wa akhru wa da'amana. إن الحمد لله رب العالمين إباد الله رحمكم الله إن الله يعمر بالأدل والإسان وإتاء ذي القربى وينهان الفاشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيذكم لعلكم تذكرون أذكر الله يذكركم ودعوه يستجب لكم ولذكر الله أكبر O servants of Allah may Allah be merciful to you verily Allah commands you to act with justice to confer benefits upon one another and to do good to others as one does to one's kindred and forbids evil upon uh, forbids evil which pertains to your own selves and evils which affects others and prohibits unlawful uh, rebellion against lawful authority. He warns you against being unmindful. You remember Allah, Allah too will remember you. Call upon Allah and Allah will make a response to your call. Verily, divine remembrance is the highest virtue. We ask Allah to allow us to leave this Jummah better than we came into it. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna kantu samiyun alim. Our Lord, accept for us this service, uh, from us this service, and for Thou art all hearing and all knowing. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We have a few announcements that I'll just make uh, very briefly. But first off, just a reminder as I uh, shamelessly plugged in, in the khutbah, we have a uh, our ninth session of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and I. Uh, as a member, remember this is a 10-week uh, session, so this is the second to last session, and today we will be talking about uh, the farewell uh, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi So as things get to wi wind down, last time we talked about uh, Fateh Makkah and the conquest of Makkah, and today we'll talk about uh, things starting to wrap up, and if we have time, inshallah, of the passing of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi but we have one more week after this. So that's tonight at 6 p.m., um, and uh, the, the, the details of that will be posted on our WhatsApp channel, as well as uh, on our Facebook. We'll live stream it on Facebook, and we'll later upload the recording to YouTube. But if you're interested in joining, just let me know. Um, we, we have a WhatsApp channel for that. Uh, we have a Quran halakha that will be happening on August 15th, on Sunday, August 15th at 11 a.m. This will be a uh, halakha focused on Surah Al-Humaza. Um, and uh, we're going to go through uh, the uh, a really rich discussion of this chapter. Uh, and we, we have uh, some more details about that in the, uh, the newsletter. If you have any questions about that, check out our website or uh, again, just uh, reach out to myself or to Shadi or to Muslim Space. We'll be happy to help you as we can. Uh, and as always, uh, and just another note, we, we have a new uh, post on our uh, mental health blog. So for those who don't know, um, we have a uh, awesome mental health blog that uh, uh, our resident board member, new board member now, Sana Raza Hussain, uh, runs. And it's a really important topic for us. And especially in the context, when we look at it in the context of the prophetic tradition, why we need boundaries. Um, so uh, be sure to check out our website under resources and go to mental health blog. Um, it's also uh, posted onto our Instagram and every other place. So be sure to check that out. And lastly, uh, as always, uh, we have uh, chapter and office hours uh, and community check-ins seven days a week by appointment. So you're welcome to set up an appointment with me. Um, you can uh, check out our website for that. You can touch base with me. Uh, these are uh, 
sessions that focus on anything from faith, life, relationships, identity, challenges, relevance of spirituality, anything like that. That's intentionally supposed to be a listening space. So you are uh, you are the person driving that session, and I'm just there trying to trying to hear you out. So inshallah, I hope that uh, this khutbah has been a benefit. I hope this message has been a benefit, and uh, may Allah uh, reunite us again uh, in the next Jummah, if not sooner, inshallah. <laughs>